I used to, you know, I, I used to stand behind the table and sell my father's uh, speeches on cassette tapes and CD, DVDs and uh, uh, VHS and things like that. And have, I would have his books on the table. So when they would come out of the meeting, I'm standing there calling the people over to buy the tapes. And there was one uh, immigrant Muslim brother. He saw a picture. There was a, a historical picture. You, Malcolm X, Donald Elijah Muhammad, Imam W. D. Muhammad with. Uh, Doc, uh, Honor Elijah Muhammad, Honor Elijah Muhammad with Dr. King. You know, it's just a photo. It was almost like a film strip showing these different stages in our history. And uh, he was condemning them. I said, well, if I found, it was found in critical condition, you know, and I needed my life saved, I need to get to the ER, or I might not make it. And uh, the ambulance didn't show up in time, but here come my poor brother from down the street in his hoopty. You know, it's backfiring, smoke, you know, rust falling off of it, but it's rolling. <laughs> and he drags me into his back seat, saves my life, takes me to the ER, the doctor administrates the medicine, and saves me. No, I'm not going to condemn him or his hoopty. <laughs> I'm going to love him, and I might go out there and kiss that old rusty raggedy car right on this rusty paint and say, thank you for saving my life. And that's how we view the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because we wouldn't have got here without him. We wouldn't have had the ability to walk with our head up when some little Caucasian child walks over to you and say, and, uh, and your child come home from school like I did with my parents and said, our people own your, your people. I was, something I was watching on TV, they told me, you can't watch, you ain't supposed to watch that. You're supposed to watch Good Times. I said, I watched Good Times and uh, I think it was R.T. Bunker. He said, you, can, you ain't supposed to watch because I joined in. As a I went to Montessori school, which was a very good school. And, um, and that's another long story too. My father didn't, see this is how bad those teachings were in his mind. He did not want me mixing up with the nation of Islam. So then he would have to unbrainwash me and he didn't know if he could, uh, ever bring me back because I'm sure he spent his entire life trying to bring some of those back that found that comfort space like we see in the ghettos of many of our towns you know we visit our friend and you think he's the richest man in the neighborhood he gets out in his clean new suit and he got the, the shiny shoes on and watches and rings he steps in his Cadillac nods his head at you and drives off in his Cadillac until you ring the doorbell one day and you open the door and you see his teeth missing, that conk is out of his head, his head just as nappy as yours, and his t-shirt's dirty, and his house is filthy. And you like, what? I thought this dude was all, you know, everything. But he's happy as he can be. And a lot of us, as long as we can make our neighbor think we're doing good, we're good. <laughs> you know, the reality, until the reality sets in, you, you know, you're trying to put everything in the back of your brand new Cadillac and move somewhere else. Uh, yeah, that's an unhealthy way to be, that we should, want, we should want more than a fantasy, that we deserve what every human being on Earth has. If the, uh, I know the, the Native Americans and the Mayans, they're discovering the ancient artifacts and the beauty and the great wealth, the great, great wealth of their ancient societies. Because, like I say, the, West, the Western mind that said this is the only image that the world needs has repented all of that. And if you watch some of these nature shows and study the programs that you see on television, they completely 360, and now they're giving this information freely. They're helping uh, put the, the information out of these great civilizations that existed all over the world. I even hear them talking about the caveman. The Neolithic and all, man and all this, they, they, don't, they don't call them ignorant no more. I, I joke with my children sometimes, I say, that's because they identify with them now. <laughs> so he can't be a big dumb brute. He ain't black no more. You know the caveman ain't black no more. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> well, I mean, what we grew up watching. I'm not being racist because I know that all human beings have the same exact intellectual uh, ability because we've seen it. We were denied education, not just denied to have the social life of a family, a man, husband, wife, and child. We were denied education. They didn't allow us to even go to church. We couldn't even get 
the spiritual education. So to came, come from less than being like a brutal tool, a hammer or a screwdriver in a drawer that somebody picks up, uses, and drops down and throws in the trash when they're done with it, if they don't want it, or sell it. Now they don't throw nothing in the trash. They, they, they would have sold you to somebody that, you know, that could handle you if they didn't want you no more. Um, coming from that, uh, there's no way in the world that we would say that any human being is genetically predisposed to be superior to another human being. Not because of your race, not because of your language. You know, we, for a minute they had us thinking that Asians just had better, bigger brains than everybody on the planet Earth. You know, it's what they're exposed to in life. They have the same potential, but there's something to be said of culture. The culture of a people, uh, if it's uh, geared towards intellectual development, you're gonna find a lot of smart people coming out of that culture. Uh, but America is a democracy, and we have the best of everything. And that's what we have to continue to promote in America, that we are the best, that we want the best, and we represent the best. And we have to not just nurture, and America has changed. And we're not just nurturing the life of one people, we nurture the life of all people. And, uh, and all of the sciences. And the sciences are universal, you know. Uh, the logic, God's logic, and his messages is universal. You know, if one thing if one thing applies to one discipline, more than likely it applies to other disciplines. Uh, but we have to re-educate our society and change our culture so that people won't fear knowledge, and we have to stop listening to the fear mongers. <laughs> you know, the devil, his greatest weapon is fear. You know, fear of poverty, fear of loss, fear of, you know, uh, if you have less than the man next door or, or, or over the street that we should all look at fear as being something that's in the pos positive in the life of a person when it comes from protecting you from the evils of this world. And we always turn to God for um, uh, refuge, refuge. I say, I say this all the time in Arabic. I tell my children, I say, say, and believe it works. I seek refuge in Lord, in my Lord God, Allah. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan the cursed. Because Satan is cursed, you know? And if you follow him, or if you're tricked by him, then you're going to accept his plight. You know, into your life. So we seek refuge in God, and uh, I hope that I've done a good job. You know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. When I'm at the mosque, I always wait till I smell food, and then I shut up. Okay. All right. Thank you. A lot of white guys. We're coming to the close of our program. We would like to thank, thank <laughs> all the believers who work so hard and contribute to this program, to the sacrifice that we made to bring Imam Warf Dean Muhammad to Kalamazoo, Michigan. For the people that supported us, believed in us, in our selling of dinners, we sold dinners uh, to make this possible. We also would like to thank the mayor, who he's gone now, and we also like to thank the reporter that has come to follow us today. He's been, been among us once before. Imam Warfdin Muhammad II, we really do appreciate you and your family, your sacrifices that you have made traveling to Kalamazoo, Michigan. It is a great honor to have you among our presence. 
We also have the New African Market. They've also traveled far to come here to sell their wares. Please support them. Some of their stuff is not expensive. We all go to the store. We all buy things at the store. We also have dinner. We're asking for a donation. Whatever you can afford, if you can't or you don't have it, you will still eat. This is our Dawa project. We always do, in this month, we go to the street. We feed the neighborhood. We feed our people. Also, the Bilal and Islamic Center, once a month, second Friday of the month, six o'clock, we have a unity dinner, community dinner. We ask people to come out. We ask each other to bring a dish to feed somebody else. And we've always been blessed with more food We've always been blessed with more food. We look around the Imam Hassan and said one day, well, I don't think nobody's coming. I said, don't worry about it, they'll be here. We had so much food, we just have to give food away to ask people to take food with them. We do this once a month, inshallah. We will continue on with our journey. Allah truly has blessed us. Alhamdulillah, God is greatest. Imam Hassan, you got what he said. I just once again want to thank the hard working committee for their hard work. Could you please stand? Those that work hard to bring this help bring this about. Sister take a stand. Layla, Imam Hassan. Let's take wife. a stand. Uh -huh. Anyway, we thank you. I would also like to acknowledge our cooks. Yeah, and uh, we have announced the Dow Coordinator. Mm -hmm. right and we also have in our president the Dow Coordinator. Co coordinator. Coordinator. Brother Sam, brother. Brother Norman. Brother Norman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and his wife. And his wife. <laughs> Thank you. We also would like to acknowledge the people that have traveled near and far because I know some of you have traveled over two hours to be among us and it is highly appreciated that, that you have traveled so far. Our dinner is being provided. Um, my son, Abdul Hamid Yaya, he can stand with our cook and his volunteer that cooked with him, his volunteer Larry, that cooked with him. They will be serving the dinner um, to us. Please enjoy. Make sure that you almost a fellowship among each other. Talk to each other. Know your neighbors learn each other, at least where you come from, from what city you're from, because a lot of people are from a lot of different cities. Everybody is not from Kalamazoo. Um, Brother Robert Salim will give the closing prayer. Okay. Um, I was asked to uh, wrap things up. We just wanted to talk, this was all about legacy. You know, um, the influence that was brought to us by Imam Muhammad and brother, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, affected our lives, you know, considerably. Um, when we started in Kalamazoo, um, basically our community was the pioneer and the immigrant community kind of followed us as we got out in front and braved the, uh, the uh, criticism, the racism, the, uh, I won't call it oppression, but 
it was tough working in these different factories and what have you, and them knowing that you were Muslim, and especially if you were from the Nation of Islam. There was a time when we actually had to have people come out and protect us at the plant. I mean, you know, get some support. We didn't have any businesses, um, but the influence that we had, Imam Muhammad, when he first came in, mentioned, align yourself with people of common interests. And I can recall looking in the Kalamazoo Gazette and seeing that they were gonna start a new organization called the Northside Association for Community Development. So I went to the meeting and I met some people who wanted to make a difference in this neighborhood. I went to the bathroom. When I came back, I was president. <laughs> That's kind of how it went. But basically, my job was to empower the director, who was a Presbyterian minister, who was the first person that said to me, Inshallah. He had studied in theology, and he, he told me one time about one of the ministers here that has a mega church. I mean, like a mega church, like in a supermarket. He said to me, because that person was downing the Muslim. And Reverend Filbert said to me, he said, I get so tired of these guys that come out here with a bellyache and say that God called them. They know nothing about the fact that we are all from the Abrahamic faith. So where I'm going with that is the fact that once we got that committee going, we were able to make a difference, form a committee that started rehabbing the homes on the north side. We uh, actually, the, the three, as you leave here tonight, you'll see that there are three new homes on this adjacent to here and on the corner. Those were our first new construction. Yeah, it was a committee that grew out of the one that started out in the basement of a church right here in this neighborhood. Habitat for Humanity wasn't here yet. The uh, Vine Street uh, Housing Corporation that has uh, taken all the block grant monies, they weren't here yet. They came to us for advice. I say that to say this, as time went on, we saw that things like that could work. So some of the neighbors met every Thursday morning for a, about a year and a half, and we came up with the concept, what can we do for the economic push in this neighborhood? And so there's a, a little mini mall down on the corner of Westnage and, and North Street. There are four different establishments in that, in that mall. There's the credit union, there's a barber shop, and then there's, um, you, know, you know, in our neighborhood, we gotta be able to buy hair these days. And there's a place called Chicago Munchies. It just so happens that after all that time of being in a drought, getting to this point, now, Two of those businesses are owned by Muslims, right in our neighborhood. And the Chicago Munchie place sells nothing but halal, something we did not foresee. One more point on legacy, and then we're, we'll just close out with a very short prayer. This is called the Douglas Community Association. There's a street just to, down here that's Douglas with one S. This is the Frederick Douglas Community Association. The Frederick Douglas Community Association was formed in 1919. 1919. Because when the soldiers were coming home from World War I, most of the Caucasian soldiers had a place to go to socialize. They had their post, they had their, what do you call it, the legion, places like that. So the Frederick Douglass Community Association was formed so that we could have a social outlet 